When people say, you know, what's it like to work with the government in these kind of disasters? I say, I, I invite you to recall every experience you've ever had with a paper straw. That's what it's like. This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What should the federal government do in a disaster? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason. My colleague Liz Wolf, Reason associate editor, is here. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Two major hurricanes made landfall within two weeks, devastating the Southeast. Hurricane Helene has killed more than 200 people, and more than 90 are still missing in North Carolina, where overflowing rivers and tributaries flooded the western part of the state. More than 14,000 remain without power. Hurricane Milton grew to Category 5 status in the Gulf before hitting Florida's west coast just south of Tampa Bay as a Cat 3. It caused at least 23 deaths, and both storms are likely to cause over $100 billion in economic damage. Today's guest is part of an organization that's been on the ground in both places, helping with disaster relief. Brian Trasher is the vice president of the United Cajun Navy, a volunteer organization that started in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. Brian, thank you for joining us. Yeah, appreciate y'all having me. I'm going to play a clip from a great documentary short produced by Freethink Media uh, about the United Cajun Navy to give our viewers a quick impression of what you all are, uh, what you are all about. Uh, we'll be linking that full documentary in the description. I recommend everyone check that out. Uh, Freethink does great work, but let's take a quick look at that just uh, so everyone can kind of get a sense of what the United Cajun Navy is. If anybody's gonna be able to work with us, they have to be faster than the standard. This is not something you take on for fun. People are screaming for help. The Cajun Navy, a flotilla of volunteers from Louisiana. Just regular guys who say they don't wait for help, they are the help. The concept of civilian-led rescue is a paradigm shift for how rescues are gonna be conducted from this point forward. So some of the dispatches from Western North Carolina have been almost hard to believe. I mean, we're seeing like old fashioned mules used to deliver supplies to people who have had the roads to their houses destroyed. What are the conditions like on the ground right now? Um, they're really poor. Um, and, you know, definitely shout out to the uh, the Mountain Packer Mule Ranch uh, out there in North Carolina. They uh, those mules became famous overnight. And a lot of people were attributing them to uh, to us, and we were working with them and using them to, to transport people and supplies. Uh, but just want to reiterate that it wasn't our idea, and it's not our not our mules. Uh, Mountain Pecker Mule Ranch, a, a great new partner of the United Cajun Navy, and we're blessed to have them. Um, you know, some of the areas that we uh, we flew over in in the mountains. Um, you know, I. I hate to describe it this way, but it's the only thing I could think of. It's like Pompeii, but with mud. Um, so it's it's really, really bad. There were people that were, you know, completely washed out by basically hydrokinetic uh, mudslides that were very concentrated in these valleys um, as the, the, you know, trillions of gallons of rainwater came down from Helene and had nowhere to go but through these valleys and, and just washing out towns and uh, and homes. And unfortunately, there was a... A, a large scale loss of life, and there's still a lot of people missing. I mean, a whole bunch of towns were just straight up entirely wiped away, right? Yep. Do we have any sense of, you know, which towns we've lost and the scale of that? Can you can you sort of paint a picture for our, our listeners and viewers? Yeah, so one of the towns that has you know become more well known as far as uh, the the most destruction is uh, Chimney Rock. Um, that there's very few surviving structures in that town at all. I mean, I'm talking just structures, period. And the ones that that are there are d badly damaged, but there's like a few pieces of structure uh, still standing. But the uh, the roads are washed out. There's, you know, uh, I think the only people there are uh, like the mayor and some local officials and perhaps a few residents. But now there's a lot of, uh, you know, like contractors and perhaps FEMA National Guard people there. Um my understanding, I've had some friends that have gone in and talked to the mayor, and I, his name's escaping me right now, but um, there's a lot of rumors been online about, you know, that town never coming back, and things like that. And 
I don't think that is at this point, it doesn't seem like that is the mayor's or the town's intention to not come back. Um, there was a lot of, after Hurricane Katrina, there were some people questioning about whether, you know, New Orleans would ever come back. And, um, you know, it's it, next year will be the 20th anniversary of Katrina and I'm sitting in New Orleans, Louisiana right now and it exists. So um, it's best in these cases just to listen to the locals um, and the leadership that they have and and uh, and let them make their own decisions. They, they have a right to determine their own future. You've mentioned um, Katrina in Louisiana. That's integral to the origin story of the Cajun Navy. Could you just yeah. spell that out a little bit for everyone? What what um, about the aftermath of Katrina, which m- most people w- listening to this will remember the devastation of that? How did how was the Cajun Navy birthed out of that? Yeah, so our founder Todd Terrell was part of the original uh, sixty eight boats that that went down to New Orleans and joined with uh, General Honoré, who was uh, took command of Joint Task Force Katrina, appointed by President George W. Bush. And uh, if for people that don't remember, Hurricane Katrina passed through um, Louisiana and Mississippi Gulf Coast uh, as close to a Category Five uh, hurricane, a tremendous storm surge. And in the in the days following the landfall. Um, the the levees in New Orleans is all, all pretty much below sea level. Um, the levees that hold the river back and the lake back uh, were under so much pressure, they eventually uh, failed and water started rushing into the city and it didn't stop until it equalized with, with the lake, um, the lake, you know, the tide of the lake. So um, the city was underwater for um, a couple of weeks and then just a couple of weeks later, Hurricane Rita came uh, and it actually hit west of New Orleans on the coast of Louisiana around Lafayette. But because the surge came and the tide uh, was already high, um, they had already begun dewatering the city, but it pushed water back into the city again. So they basically had to de- dewater the city twice. Um, and so anyway, uh, going back to uh, Todd in the original 68, um, they were going around um, in neighborhoods and and taking people off of rooftops and clearing out houses and trying to remove debris and they were doing it all in shallow water boats, um, which a lot of these, these folks are, uh, skilled, you know, hunters and fishermen. And they're used to these, uh, operating these, what we call, uh, duck boats or mud boats. And, uh, they, they can operate well in, um, in shallow water. They're very tough. They're used to hitting, you know, stumps in the swamp and things like that. So they've built very tough. So with, you know, you'd be going down uh, a waterway essentially, and you might hit a stop sign you know, where you might hit a light pole or something or a car. So uh, these kind of vessels were very uh, intricate in that. And so the the media sort of had created this colloquialism called the Cajun Navy, meaning the Cajun being, you know, Louisiana origins and having their own fleet of boats. And uh, from my, my dad went through Hurricane Betsy in 1967. And he says he remembers the media talking about the Cajun Navy because similar things happened back then. People were taking their boats and, and rescuing uh, people in the lower ninth ward of New Orleans. That is one of the lowest points of the city, elevation wise, and uh, and tends to flood, will flood if the uh, levees fail. How did they begin to organize themselves in the very beginning? Like, how did that work? So there was a sort of a loose organization um, after Katrina, responding to you know a few minor floods, things like that. But in 2016, there was a, a massive flood in Baton Rouge, Louisiana where the rivers um, had overtopped. There's a lot of rain and rivers had overtopped and, and, uh, and flooded uh, most of the city. And the um, uh, uh, Todd and a lot of the groups that he stayed in touch with uh, went out and did more rescues, rooftop rescues and, and things like that with these boats. And after that, he um, sort of decided that he wanted to like memorialize a formal group and he formed the United Cajun Navy um, because there were some other, it was different sort of, Cajun Navy groups, if you will, or teams, and he brought a lot of them together, and that's why they named it United Cajun Navy. And uh, and they in the next year, 2017, they responded to Hurricane Harvey in Houston, and that's sort of when the it, it, locally it was already well known, but that's sort of when it first blew up nationally, and all of a sudden everybody was talking about the Cajun Navy. And um, since then, we've responded to uh, dozens of different types of natural disasters, um, some in other countries like the Bahamas other territories like Puerto Rico and the United States, Virgin Islands, um, Costa Rica. Um, and we actually, when the, when, when the war first broke out in Ukraine, we had a, a, a volunteer who was a former, um, Marine medic and he, uh, 
had some contacts in Poland and he, at, we sent some supplies to him. He was able to get him over the border to people in Ukraine. And this is before, you know, cause people get mad at me when I talk about that, but this is before Congress started sending billions and trillions of dollars over to Ukraine. This was just literally just like people getting their neighborhoods blown up, uh, and kids, you know, living in fear. So we were, we were sending them some initial supplies. So, um, so we've grown a lot since then. We have eight different state chapters now with, uh, with, with we try to maintain local leadership. Um, and, uh, we've grown to, you know, almost half a million Facebook followers and, you know, I'm not sure on the other platforms, but we've grown a lot. I, I want to bring us to the present. Um, what are the conditions like? So obviously the conditions remain awful in Western North Carolina, but yep. you know, right after this happened over the, the span of less than two weeks, we also saw hurricane Milton batter Florida. What are the conditions like? What are your guys reporting on the ground there? And I mean, it seems almost untoward or unseemly to compare the levels of devastation, right? These are two entirely different situations. But I do think there's something interesting here about how part of the reason seemingly why Western North Carolina is suffering to the degree that it is, is because people really were not expecting this type of thing to happen. I mean, you're talking about a place that's very far away from coast and just the amount of rainfall that they got really brought them to their knees. It was hard to anticipate how this would play out. And yet at the same time, when Hurricane Milton hit, Florida's authorities had been very aggressive with ordering some 5 million people to evacuate. And a whole bunch of people heeded those warnings and took them very seriously and uh, got the hell out of Dodge. And it has seemed like thus far we've seen a little bit less devastation. Like there were two very different levels of preparation uh, by, by, by no fault of the people themselves, seemingly. How are you seeing this play out on the ground? Is that a correct assessment? It is. I'll start with um, Florida. We've deployed Florida uh, at least half a dozen times for major hurricanes. And, um, you know, we uh, internally, we've nicknamed Governor DeSantis Rapid Ron. And it's because he he he's the, the state has such a good emergency response plan that they they know exactly what they have to preposition, where they have to preposition it. They respond very quickly. Um, normal deployment for us could be anywhere from a week to two weeks, just treating emergencies. Um, in Florida, it's usually no more than four or five days. And then you start seeing the local resources take over, um, and people not needing the NGO help as much anymore. They always need it to some degree, but, um, the Florida response very quickly. So I'll talk real quick about what I saw in Florida because I went to the East and West coast. Um, and we, uh, so when, when Milton was getting close to landfall, it went through what's called an eye reformation process. And I'm not assuming y'all know this. I'm just for the benefit of any, any of your viewers that might not, but went through an eye reformation process where it makes that turn, it makes that spin. And then the eye, uh, sort of, um, uh, it's kind of like if you're watching water go down a drain, you know, it might kind of, the hole might plug up and then it, and then it forms a funnel again. So that's what it was doing. And as, and, but by the time it was trying to reform itself, um, it, uh, it started making a landfall. And so it didn't get it, have enough energy. It didn't have enough, hang on, I got to get a phone call. Come on, stop, stop, stop. So it didn't have enough energy to make a full circle around again and create another funnel. So what that did is it broke off part of the, so I would say the Eastern, uh, quadrant of the storm off into its own supercell traveled over the state of Florida and, and spun up over a hundred tornadoes from what the meteorologists are telling me, not all of them made, made landfall. Um, but, but there was a lot. And so on the East coast, you had people that were bracing for hurricane like conditions, but not taking the brunt of it, like the West coast and entire neighborhoods and towns got wiped out by, by hurricane damage. Um, and then on the West coast around, uh, the Sarasota area is where Milton made landfall. So you see the normal, sort of damage path that, that, that comes with that, you know, surge, you see, you know, marsh grass laying over trees, laying over, you see wind damage. And then there was also some hurricane, I'm sorry, some tornadoes that spawned on the West side too. Um, and then on top of that, you know, your normal byproducts of these types of events, uh, loss of power, loss of internet, um, not no running water, things like that. Um, so anyway, we went down and um, we set up a, uh, a point of distribution in Parrish, which is in Manatee County, right outside of Tampa. And we have a partnership with Lowe's. So we, we posted up at, at a Lowe's location there and used their parking lot to hand out a bunch of relief supplies that we had sent in by 18 wheeler. And that went on for like about three days. And then we demobbed that and started shifting over to 
uh, Stewart, Florida, Vera Beach, and uh, and and uh, Fort Pierce, the uh, in Spanish Lakes area, which which is all areas that again we're not in a direct path of Milton, but got hit very hard by these tornadoes that were spawned by that supercell. How do you dis? You know, there's a lot of moving parts when you're talking about a disaster response, and you're dealing with all these different NGOs, state government, federal government, local governments. How, what are your strategies for figuring out, okay, this is where the Cajun Navy fits in. This is how we can best help. And like, what is your specific niche that you are adding? And how does that change dealing with a situation in Florida where the governance is different and the, the, the conditions on the ground are different than North Carolina? You look at the, uh, the, you look at the storm, the weather event that that's coming, and the, based on the strength and characteristics of that storm, we we try and we have our own in-house uh, chief meteorologist uh, Jeff George is out of Gainesville, Florida, and he's been our uh, meteorologist for about six months now. And so that way we can uh, we have somebody to explain to the lay people sort of how to anticipate the weather, and then when we're putting content out there about the weather, it's not just some dummy like me talking, you know, stuff I don't know about. So this is stuff that's been explained to me by an actual meteorologist. So um, we take a lot of that education into our planning and what we prepositioned uh, boats and 18 wheelers in, uh, ironically, in Milton, Florida, which is in the panhandle um, and waited for the uh, weather to pass. And um, we had aircraft stage in Pens- in uh, Destin, I'm sorry, um, uh, which was also in the panhandle. And as soon as it was safe, they started moving in um, with the swift water teams, our aircraft, and also our um, our supply line. And um, we we had one team with uh, Helene, we had one team start around the St. Petersburg area and one start in the panhandle. One went north, one went east, and they kind of met in the middle as far as like search and rescue. Um, there wasn't really any deep water a- activities for us uh, following Helene in Florida. Um, but with Milton, there was, and there's still neighborhoods that are underwater in, uh, in West New Florida that we saw, um, uh, after Milton, you know, another thing uh, about Florida is we'll get some, um, we'll get some, uh, what we call emergency tickets and people reaching out to us through various methods with, uh, emergency situations. And the first few days, you know, we'll, we'll respond and, and do what we can to help people, um, by about the fourth day, we were showing up to some of these and you already had, uh, like, for instance, Hillsborough County Sheriff. Uh, there was one neighborhood that was flooding. Um, and what it was is the water got pushed up these rivers. And as it comes back down, that's when it starts flooding. So they didn't know, like, it didn't happen right away. So they had people like calling saying, no, we're having a kayak out of our neighborhood and all that. We got, we sent two boats down there and Hillsborough County Sheriff was already there with airboats, with a helicopter near and all that. So we just kind of checked in with them, say, hey, need any extra backup? You know, like, we're good, but we got your number, you know, that kind of thing. So it's it varies. Sometimes we're, um, we're the first ones there and we do what we do. And then other times we just offer assistance or sometimes it's best to stay out of the way. I have a sort of random question that just jumped into my head right now. I think so frequently when these disasters strike, a lot of people who aren't used to being affected by this, who don't work in disaster relief, who don't live in Florida, you know, idiots like me, you know, a New York City um, resident, we have this sort of judgment that we uh, heap upon those who choose not to evacuate, those who choose to not follow uh, the orders of Ron DeSantis or whomever else. Um, I'm curious, you, I would imagine, have a lot of experience with the many reasons why people make that decision. How do you look at that decision and have your views of that decision changed over time? My personal views haven't changed over time because I've always been of the mindset. I mean, I, you know, again, my parents grew up going through hurricanes, Betsy and Camille in the 60s. Their neighborhoods flooded. I was taught to respect hurricanes. I was taught to respect Mother Nature. The rule of thumb for me is any hurricane coming uh, anywhere near where I live uh, that's stronger than like a Category 2, I'm 100% evacuating. Um, for Hurricane Francine, which we had just a few weeks before all these down here, it was only, I think, a category one. I did stay home. I was comfortable that I wasn't going to flood or have any serious damage. I lost power for, you know, a couple of days, but that's not the end of the world. Um, with regards to Florida, really anywhere, like the one excuse for not evacuating that drives me absolutely bonkers 
is when people say, well, I've been living here since whatever, and I've never had to evacuate. And I'm like, yeah, but like, you know, the guy who had a heart attack and died never had a heart attack before. Like, what's this, what's, what's that got to do with anything? Like, I mean, it's not, you know, post hoc ergo proctor hoc, right? It's, it's, this is a different kind of an, an event and you have to take it seriously. Some, yeah, and, and the thing is, is that like mandatory, I know they had mandatory evacuations. Usually those don't get like heavily enforced. It just depends on where you're at, the local sheriff or the state police or the governor or whatever, how, how much they want to enforce it. Um, but we did talk to many sheriffs prior to Milton making landfall and they provided us with, they had a database of people who elected to stay and they shared that with us, uh, just as a starting point for when we went in. Um, so we're not looking for a, a needle in a stack of needles. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of loss of life, uh, but I think it, I, I've got to wait for the official report, but I think a lot of it came from the, uh, the, the tornadoes, which are unexpected and, and harder to get out of the way of versus people who stayed behind. Uh, and might have gotten trapped in floodwaters or got hit by falling debris or the house collapsing or something like that. Yeah. I'll, and I'll mention one more aspect to the evacuation situation. You know, you think that you have all this time because you're watching the hurricane for days and days, but people are weighing different calculations. And I can just testify as someone who lives here in Florida. I'm on the East Coast. I was not badly affected by this. But I have friends that were in evacuation zones who basically got stuck there because the gas, the fuel just ran out like right. fast. And, so, and then they're stuck in traffic. They can't evacuate north. Uh, that was their plan. Uh, some people were able to evacuate south to Miami area uh, or, you know, the, the uh, east coast, uh, southern east coast. But that carries its own risks. So. It's not always so simple as like you, there's, uh, you know, the, there's the guy who uh, Lieutenant Dan who decides to ride it out in Tampa Bay. And then there's people who just unfortunately got stuck. So there's kind of like a spectrum. Of, it, you're you're uh, right. And there's some people that yeah. there's some people that can't afford it. Like they really don't have the That's extra true. money for gas or to find a hotel room. There's people who have medical problems and they need to stay uh, close to, you know, like a dialysis machine or, a you know, uh, oxygen, things like that. Um, the people who live in retirement communities. So there's a lot of different reasons why people don't do it. That's why I say the ones that draws me nuts, are people that can and just don't, yeah. um, there's some people that can't, it's always going to be the case. And that's why I always, that's why I have sort of like a line of demarcation. Um, if something's strong enough and within a certain amount of miles from where I live, um, I'm evacuating because I'm not going to wait till the last minute because I know I'm going to get stuck in traffic. I mean, New Orleans yeah. is, is basically an island surrounded by a river and lake. So it's, there's only a few ways in and out. Um, and if you don't get on the road early, you're going to be stuck in traffic and, uh, you know, you're going to get, God forbid, stuck behind some guy in an electric car who that died and now he's blocking traffic, you know. I want to ask you about the role of the federal government in the response to the hurricanes, because FEMA in particular has come under a lot of criticism. Before we get into the specifics of that criticism, just what is your overall view of interacting with FEMA and other branches of the federal government on the ground during this? You know, with regards to uh, the way the way FEMA responds, it's always different. You know what I mean? Um, it, it really depends on whether or not the outcome of what's expected plays out or not better or worse. When the outcome is better than they thought, then FEMA usually looks good, right? Because it's not, not as many dire emergencies. They, they show up with the guard, they bring in supplies, they start giving out public assistance, they get with the local leaders, start getting their, you know, intel synced up and all that kind of stuff. When it's worse than they thought, like Katrina, like North Carolina, um, then it's, uh, then they look bad, right? That in, in the response was slow, but I can also tell you, and I mean, some people have accused me of defending FEMA. I'm just trying to give you the facts as I see them, right? I got to I got to North Carolina uh, a few days after uh, landfall. Well, really, a few days, a couple of days after we started noticing what was going on in North Carolina, we knew that that Helene was going to be a problem because it was so strong and moving so fast. So, like when a hurricane's moving fast, it causes a lot more problems further inland because it's just it's like anything else, like a car running into a house. If it's going really fast, it's going to go through the whole house, right? So. That's what was happening. I got to, I flew into Charlotte 
Um, I drove to Hickory. Uh, I got on a helicopter, went to Asheville. And when I walked out of the FBO in Asheville, I saw one of the directors um, of the FEMA's response unit from DC, which I was just up there at their headquarters the week before um, in the incident room while Helene was making a pro her approach. Um, so they were there, right? Like presumably the same day I was there. However, we didn't start seeing them in the field until a few days later. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. I much prefer to let them answer those questions. All I can tell you is that they were there. They had people there. Uh, they, but it just takes, you know, I always say, you know, the 800 pound gorilla takes a long time to wake up and get moving. Right. That's why we look a lot better than we really are to the extent that we can respond quickly. Um, we have people who are, have a number of different skills. Um, we don't have to ask our lawyers for permission to do anything. Usually we just use our lawyers for bail hearings. So we don't have to ask them for all kind of a, a permission to do stuff and cut through red tape. FEMA has to go through all that. They, they're governed by the Stafford Act, which is, a, if you've ever read that law, it's a very quirky document that contradicts itself many, many times. Um, and so they have more handcuffs on. So anyway, um, it, with regards again to what happened in North Carolina with the, the massive rainfall turned into, you know, these mudslides through the mountains, of course, these people didn't know that was coming. The North Carolina, you know, their political leadership didn't know it was going to happen and be that bad. Um, so again, when something turns out to be worse than you thought, the response is always slower. We found out very quickly that our bailiwick, if you will, is is boats, right? You know, we found out very quickly that that wasn't going to work. This is mountainous. This is there's no uh, mountains in Louisiana. If you ever been in Louisiana. But I'm pretty sure the highest elevation point is uh, the Indian Mounds on LSU's campus. So um, we don't have any mountains. We're not used to that. So we found out very quickly that we had to stand up an air operation. And I'm a pilot. We have another pilot in the organization. We're not helicopter pilots. We're fixed wing. But we started off recruiting a bunch of pilots, start flying in supplies to certain airports that could take supplies, you know, because our trucks couldn't get through. They were stuck somewhere on the Georgia-Tennessee line, whatnot. Um, and what, and I, it wasn't because of roadblocks, it was because of traffic and a lot of different things, but, um, but we couldn't get there fast enough with our supplies. So we started flying them in and then we started using helicopters from the Hickory airport and going out into the mountains with supplies and then bringing people back that needed care, right? Needed emergency care. Um, and so we did that. We ended up recruiting like over 50 helicopters and we ran for, you know, five or six days, uh, all day, as long as the weather would, um, allow us to. And, um, and so again, different kind of operation for us, but it was, I'm not saying it was a good thing. I'm just saying one positive byproduct of this particular event was that it sort of taught us how a, a new method of response and how to, uh, how to organize, um, an air operation, um, which is if you have the assets, it's not as hard as you might think. Um, you just have to worry. I mean, there was a lot, there was a lot of air traffic over Western North Carolina. They had a lot of near misses and the FAA was going nuts, but they did their best to accommodate and keep everybody safe. So fortunately, it wasn't any major accidents. Isn't that just an order of magnitude more expensive than doing a boat operation? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I always tell like, people- What does that look like? What are the, what are the findings now, of that? I, I always tell people to uh, teach your children to love boats and airplanes because they'll never, ever have enough money for drugs. So the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the helicopter operation cost us almost- uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars to to date. I'm just still getting bill invoices in. Um, wow. So yeah, way more expensive. But you, it was the only choice. You know what I mean? Like you, you still had you know people with like side by sides and and uh, ATVs and four wheel drive vehicles still being blocked by fallen trees and and different types of debris. So um, the helicopters we would have to uh, go and find an HLZ to place the land. And, and go in and, and do the mission and then evac out and let the next bird come in. Um, so yeah, a lot more expensive, a lot more logistics. Um, but fortunately, our donors were uh, really responded and we were able to afford to to put that together at the last minute. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the reason I really wanted to talk to you is because, you know, just based on your the social media presence of your organization, you all seem willing to call out um, missteps from the government when you see it. Uh, you're, so I appreciate getting like uh, what I see as a more honest assessment of what FEMA is doing well, what FEMA is not doing well, what other or, uh, uh, branches of the government are doing well. With the, with the air 
the, you know, the, this challenge of this being more of an air operation, one of the videos that came out of North Carolina that you all commented on and lots of people were sharing around was this uh, helicopter from the, it ended up being from the North Carolina National Guard that seemed to just spray supplies all over the place at one of the camps. Um, we actually yep. have that clip. Let's roll that real quick. And I want to get your assessment of what happened there. Okay, uh, so you see everything flying everywhere. My understanding is some of your organization's supplies were in that. Um, for what it's worth, the response from the North Carolina National Guard is to say that during an operation where uh, where they were delivering generators at the request of a local civilian organization while attempting to land, rotor wash caused items to blow away. We, the crew immediately identified the situation, aborted the landing for safety reasons. This incident is currently under investigation and the crew has been grounded until the investigation is complete. This statement was released last week. There haven't been any updates that I've been able to find. Uh, but what do you know about what happened here? And also, what the hell is rotor wash? Sorry, maybe rotor I'm still wash, just Rotor dumbest. wash is like if you have a... Uh you know, like a box fan and you turn it on and you put your face in front of it and you feel that, yeah. you know, the, the, the prop, the prop of the helicopter the rotor will make a, a, a wind wash going downwards or whatever direction it's banked in. Um, and so it's just like a giant fan blowing things that can be, you know, probably it can create, you know, maybe 60, 70 mile an hour winds, depending on how close it gets, maybe more. Um, it's the, it's the lift that keeps the helicopter in the air when you pull the collective and it rises that's what pushes it off the ground. So um, that's what everybody was feeling. And you saw the uh, things that weren't, you know, nailed down, basically getting blown all over the place. So, you know, as far as my reaction, you know, the initial reaction was I was severely pissed off because um, we had people down there. We're trying to help out. Um, we're getting uh, reports about people being stopped by officials to from delivering aid. That didn't happen to us directly. Um, but we had heard about it. And then when I saw it, the first thing I thought was that it might have been some kind of like intimidation tactic um, because we've been able we were able at that point to sort of operate not with impunity, but like we were not being stopped. Right. Um, and I thought that there were some people starting to say, like, well, you know, I started reading online comments like, well, you know, these people getting stopped. How come the Cajun Navy is not getting stopped? And we're like, we don't know, but it's not happening. Right. You know I mean? I don't know. It's because they already know who we are. I mean, it could be a number of reasons, but I thought maybe that was like a flex. Um, and, and that was pure speculation on my part. I probably should have uh, waited to before we started reacting so much. So, so, so now because of where we are, I'll be, I'll try to be a little more measured in my response. I still believe, um, as a pilot looking at the video and as other videos besides the ones the one that you showed uh, that are a little clear to me um, that they're the pilot, as far as like the generators, so the generator story, I don't know if there was generators in that Black Hawk. I know if they were delivering to, to a civilian organization, I know it wasn't us. We already had generators um, and we didn't, didn't, there was nobody from our organization that contacted the National Guard or FEMA or anybody else requesting generators. As a matter of fact, FEMA, whenever in the beginning, when they were, they were asking me, what do y'all need? Y'all need supplies. And I, we would say, no, we have enough supplies. Send them to, you know, send them to somebody that needs them. We have enough. Um, so it looked like, um, they were trying to look for an LZ. Um, from what I was told, I don't know if it was visible in the video, but I was told by my people that were on the ground there that they were throwing up arms, X arms, you know, which means don't land. And at some point they got close enough to where, you know, they could see the crew in the windshield, but they, at some point, they obviously aborted the land, um, in which case at at the, the altitude they were, I think some rotor wash would have been inevitable, but they weren't directly over the camp, if you will. There was a, it looked to me, again, this is just my perspective as a pilot, it looked to me like there was a, a bank and a pitch aft, which means he tilted to the left and then tilted back, which created sort of like a controlled, you know, uh, uh, 
sort of redirecting that rotor wall straight down to more diagonally toward the camp. That's what made me angry. Uh, and that's what made me think that it might have been um, sort of like a response to uh, them telling them not to land, right? And I also know just from being friends with Blackhawk pilots that have served in combat zones over in the Middle East, um, you know, they come across potential hostile encampments. And one of the things they would do if they were not given orders to engage, like with, with you know, with uh, violence, I guess I would say, um, they would do what, you know, what some people call like a desert, a, a, what do they call it? A, a, a desert colada or something like that. It's basically like you come down close, get the prop wash, and it stirs the sand up and creates almost like a sand tornado and just gets in everybody's eyes and blows stuff everywhere. But these are these are bad guys, right? So it's like we can't shoot them, so we're just going to screw up their camp, right? So I know they're used to doing that. So that's another reason that made me think that it might have been intentional. Having said all that, I don't know that it was intentional. It is being investigated. Um, they've already asked me, or I say some some people have already asked me, uh, asked us if we wanted an apology from the pilot. And I said, no, I said, we want to ride in the Blackhawk. We don't want an apology. Um, because <laughs> the last I thing mean, I, that I want, yeah. the last thing that I want is for a, 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 a U.S. Army pilot to have to worry about creating a public relations scandal and letting that get in the way of his job. Like, uh, yeah, it's all kind of beside the point. That would just be like the petty. I kind of find this current culture that we're in where people are so focused on the the PR side of it, the apologies, yeah. the demanding the apologies. It's like, yeah. I'm sorry, like people are people have lost their homes, like people have lost their family exactly. Members. Yeah, it's way bigger fish to fry. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, but I, I don't want to be the reason the why problem, you know, I don't like, want to. Yeah, I don't want to be the reason why soldiers got to apologize. Like, it's just not what I'm it's not what I'm into. So um, but I was like, yeah, but if they want to give us a ride, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it, you know, um, so. Like I said, North Carolina National Guard, it's their soldier, it's their pilot, it's their helicopter. They're investigating it, whatever they come up with. I don't even know if they have a an obligation to release what they find to the public or not. I don't know. But whatever comes out of it is is what's going to be, right? None of us have any control over that. Does it seem feasible? Like, you know, I'm just a layperson here. Does it seem feasible that it's an incompetence thing, not a malice problem? There was a lot of people saying that, that, well, these pilots aren't that trained and this and that. I'm like, dude. The, the Blackhawk pilots are like the top guns of the rotary wing. Like if you got a pilot that has like low time and low experience, you put them in a much cheaper helicopter. Okay. You can build a school for what it costs to buy a Blackhawk, right? So you want to put your best guys in that. So do I think it was incompetence or lack of training? I did. You'd have a hard time convincing me of that, you know? And if it was a situation where uh, he was trying, this is the only like, this is the only accidental scenario I would buy. That he was coming in fully expecting to land. When he saw the no land signal, he quickly aborted, he maybe too quickly aborted his land, pulled the collective, and that caused the aircraft to become unstable. And he was able to gain control, but not before making those maneuvers, which pushed the prop wash in the direction of the uh, of the camp. I would buy that. That's possible. Um, do I think it's because he's inexperienced? No, I think he just made a quick move and I fly planes. They don't always do what you tell them to do. You know what I mean? You just try to gain control and, and keep going. The fact that it even crosses your mind that this would have been some sort of intimidation tactic is kind of telling to me because you've worked in these situations before. I mean, is that are these sort of weird turf wars or like flexing, as you put it? Is that common in these kind of situations? Not with Blackhawk pilots. It's not. Um, yeah. Not with the National Guard, it's not. You know, we come across, um, you know, sometimes you come across law enforcement um, and EOC people that, uh, oh, you know, most of the time they're happy that we're there and they accept the help. Sometimes they're like, hey, guys, we appreciate you being here, but we got it, you know. And, and then sometimes they get really aggressive and, you know, like they're angry that we're there or whatever. And then, it, you know, I tell my guys all the time, like any local tells you to stand down just go find somebody else that needs help they you don't have to argue with them you don't have to tell them how to do their job that's just gonna make things worse um so yeah i had an eoc director in florida call me up and obviously a young dude fresh on the job and boy he was just some kind of pissed off that we were there um and uh i just had to tell him man look you know we we and, you know he kept saying he kept accusing us of self deploy and then he started quoting all the, you can take all these FEMA courses to get these certifications and stuff and they talk about self deployment and all that and this guy literally 
was must be fresh off these classes because he was quoting them. Um, but I explained to him that like we didn't self deploy. We get directly contacted by people who need help. And on top of that, we're invited by Lowe's to come on their property and set up this, this supply relief drive. So if you want us out of your county, you got to go tell Lowe's that they got to kick us off their property. Good luck. You know, um, so you get some little bet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about the, yeah. um, you know, the un, that it's unlikely that someone as well trained as uh, this Black Hawk pilot would right. just be incompetent. Yep. The reason I never underrate government incompetence more broadly is because I also saw images like this where the government was apparently delivering electric chainsaws to communities that had no power. And uh, I mean, you know, you can use a generator to charge up a chainsaw, I guess, but it's like very stupid to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so like, how would it, an, an emer like, why would an emergency disaster specializing organization how do you explain things like this when when you see it well i just think back to that somebody somewhere in the department of transportation decades ago decided that it would be a good idea to install an ashtray on a motorcycle you know what i mean like there's all kind of decisions we can scratch our head at i mean when people yeah. say you know, what's it like to work with the government in these kind of disasters? I say, I, I invite you to recall every experience you've ever had with a paper straw. That's what it's like, you know? Mm -hmm. So why, um, the, you know, the, and look, those particular, uh, we, I saw that picture of those electric chainsaws and I looked up those models and yeah, you can charge them up with a generator. They are portable, but the runtime on them is like an hour. You, you need more than that to, uh, and some people say, well, you'd need, you know, power for an electric generator. Well, yeah. But it's going to run a lot longer before you got to recharge it. You know, all you got to do is keep fuel in the generator and you can run the chainsaw. Presumably you got a big enough generator. So, um, so yeah, it's just somebody somewhere It's people in government who make important decisions based on, uh, 99% theory and maybe 1% application. And it really should be the other way around. seems like, um, there was a lot of, there was some level of suspicion and animosity, particularly in North Carolina. It got to the point where the National Forest Service was claiming that militias were hunting FEMA people in North Carolina. Right. Uh, you all put out a statement on X telling people basically to calm down. You said, you know, FEMA is not the enemy. They just do a crappy job of explaining what their role is. There was not a single person in that building who was not extremely passionate about their job and their mission to help Americans who've been affected by a disaster. You can't claim FEMA's incompetent, then turn around and accuse them of carrying out some diabolical and elaborate scheme that would require a ton of competence to pull off. Um, why do you think people who are experiencing these catastrophes are so distrustful of and angry with FEMA. Did you see that anger on the ground and can you understand it? We, yeah, we, we've had situations where they had, uh, you know, FEMA representatives at, you know, one of our distribution points signing people up for the public assistance because, you know, the main way to do it is on their website, but if you don't have power or the internet, you know, access, then you can't do it. So they're trying to sign people up manually um, when they can. There was an incident where a local had sort of like, I guess, I, I guess in, in a rude way, expressed their very strong opinion about FEMA to this FEMA employee, who I can promise you does not make any policy decisions for FEMA, right? They're, they're just somebody on the ground trying to uh, do intakes for people that need public assistance. So that's kind of why we went there with that statement. It's like you're yelling at, you know, 20 something, 30 something year old federal employees who are out there doing a job. I've been to FEMA's headquarters. I've met hundreds of people that work for FEMA. I've never met any of them that wasn't sincerely uh, uh, passionate about their job. And, and you know, I, I've never met anybody I thought was incompetent. I've met people who I thought still needed some experience. But I mean, that's only going to come with more time on the job and more action, like going to these disaster areas. So that's how they create these experienced employees. So, um, you know, we just understand that when you lose everything and, you know, the last thing you want to do is, yeah, I think that the government's going to help you, especially when, I mean, look, let's just face it. Like I'm, I shudder to get 
wade into any kind of political waters. But when people are getting seven hundred fifty dollars after just losing everything, and then the next day they read about like billions of dollars going to Lebanon, you know what I mean? Like some people are in West North Carolina, like how is Lebanon still a country after all the years they've been misbehaving? You know what I mean? Like that, they, why why are they getting all this money? We're getting seven hundred fifty dollars, and we didn't have a bank to put it in, by the way. So um, there's uh there's and I got asked this the other day about where did you know course it was like a national media you know where did all this distrust in the government came i was like well it came from a, a king that was demanding a tea tax three thousand miles away that had never visited the continent i mean that's how it started right but i mean i know they were talking about more i know they were talking about more recent events um yeah. and i think covid had a lot to do with it there was a lot of misinformation uh both from the internet and from the government itself you can point to everybody can point to several instances where the federal government straight up lied to the American people about don't believe your lying eyes. And of course you had, you know, some member of the media who was standing in front of the burning Hindenburg and trying to convince the public that it was just a mostly peaceful blimp landing. I mean, we've all seen this scenario. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ammunition, so to speak, to give the public to distrust the government. Um, now I'll fast forward to the Appalachians, the people in, in Western North Carolina, you know, I come from an area of the country, South Louisiana, where this, you know, I call them people, Appalachian, I call them mountain Cajuns because they're very similar in culture to us, mm -hmm. but they're in the mountains instead of in the swamps. Um, however, I would say they're even more sort of um, secluded and, and, and uh, introverted than we are as a culture. I would, I would liken the Appalachians more to like native tribes where they're very distrusting of anybody on the outside and you really have to prove to them um, that you're going to keep your word and do what you say you're going to do before they even begin to listen to what you have to say. Um, that's the impression I got of them. Um, but they really are an amazing people. You know I mean? Like if this country ever gets invaded, nobody's invading Appalachia. I can promise you that it, it's not going to happen. Um, probably not the swamps either. We, we got, we, we take, we, we put a lot of our problems in the swamp here in Louisiana. So, uh, just say anybody that might be listening and thinking about invading the United States, here's two areas you don't want to go to. So, uh, but yeah, so it, the distrust is there. I think that there's part of it is fueled by misinformation, but part of it is fueled by um, the, the track record that the federal government has in a lot of cases. The place I'm really worried that this all leads to is one of vast censorship online. And I think that censorship might reach different targets depending on who's in power, right? I think regardless, either way, I'm pretty screwed because I have a lot of political beliefs that the left and the right don't really like. Um, but the the thing that makes me think that we're headed in this direction was this absolutely awful piece that I read in The Atlantic um, in the wake of the uh, specifically Hurricane Milton and Hurricane Helene and some of the cleanup efforts. It's by Charlie Wartzel and it's uh, subtitled, What's Happening in America Today is Something Darker Than a Misinformation Crisis. And he goes on to talk about some of the things that we've been talking about in this conversation. He talks about how, you know, Trump was spreading, um, you know, the idea that FEMA is offering only $750 total to hurricane victims, um, when I guess in reality, FEMA is offering, you know, $750 immediately as serious needs assistance, but there's, you know, ostensibly more on the way as well beyond that. Um, he's talking about how Laura Loomer, the sort of like right wing figure, uh, has basically been tweeting about how do not comply with FEMA. This is a matter of survival and how there's been this whole, you know, he was pointing to Elon Musk as another example of this. Basically, Wartzel's point being there's this whole right wing media ecosystem that's spreading falsehoods that hurricane victims on the ground are believing. But the thing that really bothered me a lot about this is he was talking about how this right wing fear mongering is leading to angry citizens harassing FEMA and these online threats uh, and how there have been calls to send militias to face down FEMA. And he, Wardsell, I ostensibly a somewhat left-leaning writer, I mean, he writes for The Atlantic, right? He's basically trying to make the case that it's all of these right-wing fringe figures who have inspired their right-wing hurricane victim followers to basically try to call for this widespread violence or harassment of emergency response uh, and government uh, employees. To me, this doesn't square with reality because if this were a thing that had been happening and these were credible threats, we would see 
you know, arrests of people attempting to do this. We would see like it's not clear to me that any of this is substantiated. In a sense, it kind of feels like lots of things get made up by fringe right wing figures. But also it seems like this writer for The Atlantic is kind of I don't want to say fully making it up, but definitely doesn't have evidence to substantiate the thing that he's saying. I mean, are no. there militias that are going no. after team agents? Like, are, no. are journalists no. there doing was, a shitty job of reporting this? There was. So the militia thing, you know, we, that's why when the Stars and Stripes article came out about the militia and people were tagging us real heavy on X, like, what, are they talking about y'all and all this? That's the only reason why we gave a response, just a lengthy response, was because people were reading the headline and not the article. So they mm -hmm. didn't know that they weren't accused. The Stars and Stripes was not accusing us of being a militia. First of all, if you read the article, it's nothing of the kind gets suggested in there. Um, in Stars and Stripes defense, uh, they did reach out to us when they were writing a story. I, I just never got back to them. Um, and it's because I had so many I was going through and I just didn't get to them by the time they posted the story. I'm not even sure if that's the story they were calling me about, to be honest with you. But um, number one, there was no militia. Uh, there was one guy, um, on TikTok that was filming, uh, federal employees and vehicles. And he was complaining about how they were armed, which I mean, I mean, you know, a lot of those people are armed like those federal officials. Um, and by the way, uh, they were all open carrying, which is, which is legal for anybody to do in North Carolina. So mm -hmm. I don't know what he was afraid of. And he made it seem like they're on their property, but then it seemed like he was, he was close to the pro his property or whatever. And then. He was, you know, I think he might have alluded to like, you know, we have to do something about these people. And I don't remember the exact phrasing, but it was enough to to where they took it seriously and put a pause on things. Um, and I get that they have to, you know, look out for employee safety and all that. Um, but it was pretty quickly that the North Carolina National Guard put out a statement saying like they haven't encountered anything like militias. Um, it's real easy to blame. Well, first of all, it's really easy to blame Trump for everything. I mean, a lot of people in media just like treat him like some kind of a uh, big boogeyman and everything's his fault. Um, I haven't personally, I I've read a lot of articles saying that, well, Trump made false claims about this in North Carolina. I personally haven't seen anything that he said that wasn't true. Um, and anybody's welcome to send me things that have been fact checked and debunked. I just personally haven't seen it. Um, when it comes to, uh, again, I've mentioned the militia that never happened. Uh, Laura Loomer, I've seen her post some pretty wild stuff. I don't know what's going on with that girl. I don't know her. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, my personal opinion is that she's in the likes and clicks business and I try not to exaggerate or I try not to, uh, criticize what anybody does for a living, whether it's online influencer or a porn star. Like, you know, you gotta, you gotta, no, nobody else shaves my face in the mirror every morning except me. Right. So I don't have time to worry about what somebody else makes their money. Um, but does it have, you know, uh, potentially hazardous by products. Yeah, they could, you know what I mean? And, uh, the stuff about like, you know, weather manipulation and what I've said about that is I personally make no distinction between people who believe in man-made climate change and people who believe in man-made weather manipulation. I think they're both the same. I think they both think they live on a flat planet, bleed, breathe through their mouths, but that's just my opinion. You know, um, it's just, it's easy to blame the right wing, whatever, like media or influencers or this or that, because there really is no quote unquote left wing. Like the left wing is the mainstream, right? Like the legacy networks um, and publications like the Atlantic and NPR and all that, that pretty much are just mouthpieces of the government when it's in control of a certain party. And then, so you have these sort of counterculture uh, newsies and commentators who get branded as right wing and they might be right wing in some cases. Um, but they get blamed for, uh, they get blamed for these, these rumor mills. And I mean, look, there was a lot of rumors, uh, coming out after Katrina and this is back before social media is in 2005, um, before social media was really a thing. And they were talking about like, you know, people eating each other and all this kind of stuff going on. Um, you know, I, I could think of a non- uh, I can think of a sports example in 2007 when uh, LSU, which is where I went to school, by the way, shameless plug, was going to the national championship game. Um, there was a report by ESPN that confirmed that Les Miles, who was a head coach at the time, was going to Michigan. Um, they had checked out their sources. They were reporting it like it was true. It was not true. And it set, and if you're a sports fan, it set the Internet on fire. Right. 
So it's not just the fringe. I mean, ESPN is probably the foremost authority on sporting news, which is news. It's a different kind of news, but it's news. And they got it wrong, right? So everybody gets it wrong. Um, and some people do it on purpose. Uh, and some people uh, do it because they're, you know, don't know any better. So yeah. my advice I, is like, it's one thing I like about X is the community notes. It's not like these random anonymous fact checkers who say something's not true when it is. Whereas the community notes is a collection of users who are putting in input to the system saying, hey, this isn't true and here's why, you know, then they all of a sudden it'd be a community note underneath the, the post. Sometimes it feels like um, people, whether they're Laura Loomer or writers for The Atlantic, are all just like daydreaming about the country descending into like violence and, um, f you know, these factions and civil war, because it was so odd for me to read this piece in the Atlantic where it's just like acting like there's this widespread antagonism between these citizen militias and these government employees, when in reality, like, that's not the case. That's not really something that ha we have a ton of evidence for. And, you know, the real thrust, the takeaway of this was sort of like, oh, well, social media is really fueling this misinformation and disinformation crisis. The implication being that, we, well, we can't be allowed to actually have free reign of social media. We can't be allowed to be trusted with free speech and other people exercising their free speech rights. But I think you're so right that this type of crazy sort of sensationalist manufactured stories existed long before X and Facebook, right? We've seen this pop up time and time again. People in the wake of disaster are inclined to believe some of the worst uh, possible things. And there's so much information swirling that it's like the whole fog of war type thing, um, but applied to a slightly different context where it's very hard to suss out what is true and what is false. What's even more insidious than that, and I'm, this, you know, just call it the way I am, but like we're living in the real life WWE, like all of the politics and everything is just professional wrestling. You know, the, the publications like the Atlantic and CNN is Ric Flair and Laura Loomer's Hulk Hogan. You know, they're just playing their characters. And even though they're, they're talking about gearing up for this big match, WrestleMania, right? Um, in fact, the script's already been written and they already know who's going to win and who's going to lose. And these people are just playing their characters uh, to get the ratings. You know what I mean? So that's all this is. All of them, all of them are full of, you know what, all of them. Um, and it's just about building a brand and getting likes and clicks, which turns into dollars, you know? And again, if that's how you want to make your living, um, that's fine. You know, I'm only doing what I was smart enough to do. Yeah. And I, I think that it also can tend to distract us from perhaps the more prosaic explanations for what is going wrong sometimes. Like one of the things that I was looking at when I was examining FEMA uh, and their response is just their their budgeting issues are a mess. Um, the Office of the Inspector General put out a report uh, in August that found that um, they haven't been closing out their disaster declarations in a timely manner and they reviewed 79 of the declarations uh, and uh, found 26 programs with nearly $9.4 million in unliquidated funds. Um, and they described it as a problematic situation because after the period of performance ends, those funds are not reimbursable. And they continued to look and found FEMA extended 41 program periods of performance uh, that um, grants that amount to $7 billion in unliquidated funds that could potentially be returned to the disaster relief fund, which is what they use to pay out uh, dur during times like this. When, right. when, the, when the hurricane hits, the disaster relief fund is what they draw on. And we've right. had the FEMA director, uh, uh, the Department of uh, Homeland Security's Mayorkas going in front and saying FEMA needs more money. We're running out of money and, and, and they are running out of money. They have a projected $6 billion shortfall. But because of their budgeting, there's $7 billion that are you know frozen up that could more than cover this shortfall. So I guess my question for you is like, do you see that playing out? Uh, in any real sense on the ground? Like, are there budget constraints that you notice or like a, a lack of resources that are somehow, you know, making the response not what it should be? So I'll start with Mayorkas's comment, which is weird because usually people like him only make those kind of comments when it's like, 
you know, budget season or there's like a pending CR, pending government shutdown, right. things like that. Um, this was after the CR was passed and FEMA was, got the money they asked for from Congress, right? Not, you know, how's Congress supposed to know they needed more? They just gave them what they asked for. And then Mayorkas makes this asinine comment that not only are they running out of money, but he don't think he have enough money if we had another major hurricane and somebody in the universe heard him and sent one. You know what I mean? So that was a dangerous comment for that guy to make. I could think of a lot of comments that would make me question um, that guy has got to be on some just like major, major drugs, like like bad, um, because he he uh, with regards to like how how the the situation on the border has been handled. And, you know, I don't know why FEMA was even again, I'm talking out of school here, but like I don't know why he was even involved in the border. That should be. Uh, it should be an immigration uh, deal and they, that that department should get enough money and it should be the, the the National Guard, the states where these these breaches are happening and they should get enough money to do the job to defend the border. Um, but you, it's not just about the money FEMA is spending out of their budget down there, but their most experienced people are down there. And so when you're you're going into war on a storm response, you're getting your a lot of times less experienced personnel going into the field and maybe that could, and this is speculation, but maybe that could, you know, explain why the response was a little slower than they wanted it to be. Um, but yeah, again, they, the, the average American doesn't understand the, or, or pay close attention to the, the budget process that con- Congress has and all that. All they know is that we spend, we, we'd send billions of dollars to everybody except them. You know, all they know is that it costs double the amount to fill up their car with gas. It costs double the amount to go to the grocery. Um, everything's more expensive. Uh, it crimes higher. Like all these, all these metrics for their normal everyday quality of life is worse. And then when their community gets hit, they look at all this money we're spending elsewhere and not on them. That is going to create not just distrust, but it's going to create anger. Um, and so going back to look, it just so happens that you know, the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader are both friends of mine. They're from Louisiana. Um, and both of those guys said, no, we don't have to go back into session like for this. Like they, there's ways to get money to FEMA to to plug this up. And I know both of them, if regardless of politics, if they thought that Congress needed to go back in session, they would have called them back. Um, and then again, you're looking at Congress as, a, as an institution that no matter what party's in charge, raises their own credit card limit every time they hit the max. You know, I mean, yeah. I wish we could all do that. I, hell, I'd have a, a, a serious vision jet if I could just raise my own credit limit anytime I wanted to go buy whatever I wanted. Uh, but that's not real life. I have to live within my means and we can have a whole, we could have a, a whole day discussion on Congress living with that in their means, but it ain't going to happen. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it raises the question for me of what is the proper role of FEMA and is it executing that role? Um, you mentioned the Stafford Act yep. uh, as that's what authorizes the federal government to respond d- in disasters. Um, I pulled a little bit of the text here where it, it sort of constrains their action to be only when the disaster is of such severity and magnitude that effective response is beyond the capability of the state and the affected local governments that federal assistance is necessary. And so for me, um, you know, even government skeptics tend to want the federal government to intervene when an awful natural disaster hits. Like in many ways, like I couldn't really imagine a less objectionable objectionable use of my tax dollars. But then we also know that the government agencies also usually creep beyond their mission. Um, Are there any, you know, when we think about these turf wars or this friction that arises, are there any specific disaster relief areas where you think it would actually be better if the federal government stepped back and let private and local state organizations step up? Or is there some Uh, Like, you know, if you were, you know, advising FEMA, what are some of the main things you'd like to be see be done differently? So, you know, you you made the point in our our statement on X that we said they they did a FEMA did a a crappy job of explaining what their role is. And, uh, you know, I don't know what their sort of comms and 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 public affairs teams, you know, do with all. I know they 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 try. But what I always tell people is that. Most of the people in America think FEMA is a first responder, and they're not. They're second responder. So is the National Guard. They don't, as of right now, have the ability to respond 
uh, immediately to a disaster. And that's when people need help is when it, it, they need it right away. Power's out. You need oxygen. If you need dialysis, things like that. You need help right now. You can't wait a week for them to get to you. They've been talk about, and you know, we were there in their headquarters. One of a couple of things they brought up was like the idea of like a task force that does deploy immediately. I mean, if they if they get that together and get it right, get it trained, and and that'd be great. You know what I mean? Have like a recon team that goes out like right away. Um, that'd be great. Um, they talked about how the, the not to go into too much detail, but they they do have a desire to do more partnering with NGOs such as us. However, their hands are tied by the Stafford Act. They're only allowed to contract with like states and local county cities, things like that, as a uh, as a reimbursement mechanism. Um, so they're not even legally allowed to work with. I think the only NGO they're allowed to work with is the Red Cross because they're considered more of a, a quasi government agency anyway. Um, and they were part of, I, I think, the sort of the machinations that created FEMA to begin with. The Red Cross was so. Um, nevertheless, uh, they would like to, but the, there has to be some uh, sort of. You have to take a scalpel to the Sc- Stafford Act and start taking some of the handcuffs off of FEMA. I think if you did that, you would see them responding in a lot different ways, they would at least have the ability to call some audibles and do some things that they, uh, that they currently can't do. Um, so yeah, I think that there is, there's a number of, uh, a number of ways they could do better, but like I said, I think the underlying point is that if we can look at what FEMA is legally allowed to do and not allowed to do and go through that and not say, and take all the handcuffs off, just like look at what makes sense to give them a little more flexibility in the field to call some plays at the line of scrimmage instead of just going by the book. Um, because it's, and in addition to being like these reimbursement schemes with states and all that, um, FEMA goes back, the OIG does audits and, you know, it might be 10, 15 years later when they come back and try to claw back money they gave you because they found out you did something wrong. And that's another thing is like, they find out you might've mishandled $200,000 and want to take back the whole 18 million they gave you like that kind of stuff has to stop, you know? Um, but going back to the, uh, you know, the original question of, do we want the federal government to stay out of the way? My personal opinion, no. Um, because most of the time states and local communities are not going to have the resources, just, just simple catch on hand to go out and start providing a bunch of uh, fuel or a hospital ship or something like that. If it's needed. Um, I think that they could always do a better job with their local, with work, local uh, working with the local emergency management departments at the states. I know they try to do that. They try to maintain relations during blue skies so they respond better. Um, but uh, but all in all, I think it comes down to uh, FEMA has to decide what business they want to be in. You know, do they want to be a first or second responder? And if they say a second responder, that's fine. Uh, NGOs like us will exist to go in and be the first on the ground. Yeah. So if, as you're saying, then uh, that, it's ne- it's necessary for the federal government to be involved uh, because they have the resources. It's a kind of simple, you know, they've got the pile of cash on hand that can be right. infused in an emergency. So if they're inevitably going to be involved for the foreseeable future, and we just kind of have to factor in that there's going to be some level of government incompetence, and especially in a chaotic situation like that it's it's inevitable since that's a given what steps would you recommend people take at the individual and the community level to just be better prepared for when disaster strikes so one thing i would suggest is that almost every community has a food bank um what i would suggest is they start looking into some of these um, companies that sell like these sort of survival packs, like buckets of food that is, uh, can last like 10, 15 years. And, uh, it's, it's packaged in a certain way and, uh, just start stockpiling some of that. Like, just because a lot of times food bank food could go bad, could go stale. Um, and if you need it, so let's say like in Western North Carolina, there's, there might be a situation where it's going to be months before people are able to go, uh, to a grocery store and get what they need or go fill up, you know, their gas tank, things like that. Have some of these uh, supplies cashed, um, and that's just one example. I mean, somebody might have a better idea than that, but but have the ability to go quickly put all put some of these buckets of you know uh, I forget what you call it survival food or whatever onto an ATV and send it out into the mountains and pass it out. You know what I mean? That at least 
You don't have people starving to death. I mean, this this is a country where nobody should ever starve to death, right? Um, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is just to um, have, uh, you know, a harp on uh, uh, having a, a, a disaster plan and executing, whether that includes evacuating, whether that includes sheltering at home. I know it doesn't necessarily apply to the situation in North Carolina because people did not know what was in store for them. Um, but in most other communities, um, the, the local officials and local TV stations and radio, all that are always telling people have a plan executed, have a plan executed. That's good advice. I would suggest that too. That's uh, very helpful. Thank you. I'm, I want to ask you, wrap up by asking you the last question that we ask all of our guests in the theme of the show. What is a question that you think more people should be asking? The question more people should be asking. Um, I think the, the question we get asked the most is, um, why do you guys do what you do? And I always go back to you because we're a culture here in South Louisiana that number one, um, we're, we've always just culturally, culturally been taught to like, take care of your neighbors, take care of your village. Um, but we were hit, we were hit several times. And after Katrina, we were kind of left hung out to dry, uh, by the federal government. And, um, you know, we know what it's like to have that, that anger and distrust. Um, but we, we, we pulled together, we got through it. The feds came through with what they promised for the most part eventually, and we got through it. Um, the question I think people have to ask is, um, not to plagiarize too much from president Kennedy, but like not ask what your country can do for you. Like, I mean, start making yourself self-reliant, learn some survival skills. Um, if you could learn how to keep yourself and your family alive and safe for like a week to 10 days without like, just pretend you had no power and nobody's coming for you for 10 days. Could you make it? You know, I'm not talking about you kid complaining about not being able to get on their iPad. I'm talking about eating water, keeping yourself healthy and sanitary and, um, being able to just take care of your, all of your own bodily needs, um, for seven to 10 days. If you have a way to do that, um, then you don't really have to worry if the cavalry's coming right away or if the Cajun Navy's coming right away. Cause we'd love to be big enough to go get to everybody, but we'll, ne I, you know, I'm not gonna say we'll never be that big, but it would be, it'd be a massive undertaking. Um, if we ever got that big, I'm sure I'd be kicked out. Somebody better than me would come in and run it. So, uh, so we'll see, we'll see what goes on there. But, uh, that's sort of what I would say is rather than like the question, what questions should people should be asking, they should be asking themselves, like, what can I do? to uh make myself more prepared for something like this to happen and it could come in the form of like a cyber attack or whatever I mean, you never know it's not just yeah. uh, mother nature sometimes it's bad actors that's a great and important question for everyone to ponder as we wrap this brian trasher thank you very much for talking to us absolutely yeah thanks for listening to just asking questions these conversations appear on reason's youtube channel and the just asking questions podcast feed every thursday Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.